I invite us to hear the word from Holy Scripture from the prophet Hosea, chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal. The Holy One in your midst and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion when he roars. His children shall come trembling from east and from west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The first home I bought was called a shotgun house. This was down in the south, and that meant that you could fire from the front door through the back door a shotgun, and it wouldn't hit anything in the middle. Little cottage, very, very unprepossessing. Uh, didn't look like much, didn't cost much. I didn't have much money. All good. I discovered, though, that it had been around a long time, and when I began looking at it and getting the inspector to look at it, he said, this house is going to be here a very, very long time because of these huge heart of pine pillars underneath. The trusses, they don't build them like this anymore. And then look at the studs. They're two by six hard rock wood. This house is going to go nowhere anytime soon. It was small, wasn't expensive, but it was a great house. What makes a church great? A while ago I read an article in a magazine, 20th anniversary edition of the magazine, identifying the 20 greatest churches in America. It had to be wrong because ELPC wasn't one of them. In fact, the 20 that it identified were all large, very large, growing fast. Well, I went back to the 15th anniversary edition and found the 15 greatest churches identified by the same magazine. And lo and behold, of those 15, a few of them already had succumbed and were gone. They grew up quickly and they easily went away. I have learned over the course of my ministry to appreciate that greatness involves staying power. Greatness involves the capacity to be there for the long run. The first church that I served as head of staff was a little church in Virginia. Been around since 1776. It proudly advertised on the front that their pastor was Reverend Dr. Sheldon Sorga since 1776. <laughs> and I thought that was a great little church because for almost 250 years, it's been making a difference in a community, and it's still going strong. God is a God of the long haul. 
The long run matters. I like to title my sermons with rock and roll songs. Apologies to the Eagles. The long run matters for God. Now we're blessed to be part of a faith community that has shown some staying power. Both our denomination, this congregation, this presbytery, one of the oldest, been around for a while. And that's good. We've been through some bumps, haven't we? And we're still at it. Thanks be to God. I love to be part of a community that has some staying power. And when we think about the long run, our minds get drawn to that scripture that Barbara read to us about the guy who put money away, who put stuff in the right place so it would be available for him for the long haul, for his retirement. He has a first-rate retirement plan, did you notice? It cost him a lot of time, money, and effort, but that's what it takes if you're going to be a long-run kind of person. Only problem is that what looks like a long-run commitment from an earthly perspective, Jesus points out, is anything but. Now, I have to admit that reading this story gives me a little bit of pause, given what BJ already said, that I have announced my retirement upcoming. My wife and I have taken care to make sure that we're well situated. We've had advisors tell us uh, everything is in good order. And then I read this parable, I think, rats. <laughs> I'm not sure that Jesus is all that concerned about all the stuff that we've been worrying about for the last couple of years to get ready for that big change. You see, Jesus always presses us to consider whether we view life from the perspective of that which lasts beyond us or strictly how things will last for us. The farmer's values were framed entirely, what looked entirely by what looked best for him. He laid all his bets on enjoying his retirement. You notice he said, eat, drink, and be merry. He didn't utter the rest of that phrase from Isaiah, for tomorrow we die. He said, eat, drink, and be merry, because I'm going to be around a long time. But what looked like a long-run commitment on his part by worldly economic standards was, in fact, Jesus said, tragically short-sighted. One of my college professors counseled me, Never forsake long-term goals for short-term gains. Obviously, it hit a chord with me. I still remember it more than 40 years later. It's so tempting to live just for today, isn't it? And we can find good Bible for that. Jesus himself said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Just go ahead and enjoy today. We love that verse, don't we? And yet, that's not the only counsel he gives. Like the farmer in today's story, we may think that we are very future-looking and prudent. Yet if that future vision is only focused upon advancing our own interests or preserving our, what we have, then we are short-sighted. What is true for us personally is true for us also as a church. If our interest as a church is self-preservation, rather than glorifying God and living for the sake of others, we are off track. Churches don't exist to preserve themselves. Churches exist to give themselves away to the glory of God. Now Jesus offers this parable in the context of a squabble over money. Two brothers are arguing over their inheritance, and one of them calls on Jesus to be their arbitrator. But rather than adjudicate their complaint, Jesus chastises them over arguing about things that don't matter in the long run. Who gets what in the long run is very insignificant. Why be concerned about how things are going to be distributed at the price of your relationship with your brother who is your greatest asset for the rest of your life. You lose what matters most for your well-being when all you're worried about is your own well-being. There's irony in that, but also great truth. We can be conservative 
and prudent with money and possessions and yet be utterly reckless with that which we need far more. Now Jesus notes that the farmer had an abundant harvest. To his listeners, that would be a sign of God's sure blessing. God had been good to this guy. But rather than share his bounty, he hoards it to himself. He considers himself a self-made man. He does not acknowledge God at all in this story, either as the source of his wealth or as someone who has some claim on his life. And because he does not see God as his source, he is unable to see that God also will continue to provide for him regardless of how much he has. The story is all about him. If you read it, and I encourage you to go back and read it in Luke chapter 12, how many times over and over again there's me, myself, I, me, myself, I, that's the farmer's orientation. It's all about him. Now we teach our children, God helps those who help themselves, right? Many people think that's in the Bible, but it's not. It's from Benjamin Franklin and poor Richard's almanac. It may be good counsel to infants and to the indolent, but it's bad theology. And in the long run, it's also bad economics. When we withhold from others to assure our own welfare, we are assuring our own demise. Jesus' economics are very different. Jesus says, give, and it shall be given to you. Be generous, and God will take care of you. That's a way better way to live in the long run. We read a portion from the prophecy of Hosea, an Old Testament prophet. Not very well known, but an interesting guy. He was instructed by God in the beginning of the book of Hosea to enact a parable to illustrate God's love for Israel. And he was commanded to go and find a wife from among the prostitutes. So he finds a prostitute named Gomer and marries her. And she keeps wandering and having other liaisons, and he keeps welcoming her back. If that's what God calls prophets to do, no wonder people don't want to be prophets. Anybody want to be a prophet? You got a hard row to hoe. Hosea, of course, had every right to divorce her, but he didn't. Hosea modeled the essence of an unconditional commitment, inalterably committed to Gomer for the long run. In just the same way God was saying to God's people through Hosea, I am committed to you. We may act faithlessly, yet God remains faithful to us. Our love may falter, but God's love remains strong. We may wander, but God remains steadfast. Surely Hosea must have felt like dumping Gomer, wouldn't you? Yet he didn't. And this is the picture of God that the prophet has been invited to give to God's people. Now, let's be honest. The story of Hosea can be misinterpreted in ways that it should not be interpreted. Is God really like a jealous spouse? Does God condone promiscuity? Does God get angry enough with us to destroy us? Does God threaten to reject us if our fidelity falters? There's lots of ways to misread this story. We got to stay with the main point, and that is no matter how far we wander, how often we wander, God is still there for us. Now, Hosea experiences rejection, but it, notice it's not rejection from God. He doesn't respond to his rejection from Gomer with reciprocal rejection. Either does God. When we reject God, God does not reject us. We may project onto God a disposition to reject us when we walk in a way that rejects God, 
But the story of Hosea declares that that's not how God is. No matter how much we may reject God, no matter how much we may wander, this story tells us that in the long run, God's mercy prevails. God sticks with us. Israel has chosen pathways that surely should lead to its destruction. But the Lord cries out, How can I give you up, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute fierce anger. Now, let's acknowledge that like Israel of old, we also have chosen pathways that lead to destruction. And for a while it may seem indeed like judgment prevails. Because it's true that we reap what we sow. That's how it was for Israel when they were taken captive. When they lost their land and homes. When they, due to their disobedience to the Lord, had everything go lost. But that was not God's last word for them. In the long run, God restored them. Alas, the world too often hears from the church a word of judgment rather than of mercy, a word of rejection rather than of acceptance, a word of withdrawal rather than of embrace, a word of rules rather than relationship, a word of denigration, of putting down rather than of affirmation and lifting up. What does the world hear from the church? When I moved to Pittsburgh, when my wife and I moved to Pittsburgh, we found a dentist near my office on the north side. We got to know each other and he asked him what I do for a living. I told him. He responded, well, I'm a Catholic. I don't know much about Presbyterians. But I know this, there's a great Presbyterian church out there in East Liberty. They accept every, I was expecting him to talk about, you know, the big tower and all that beautiful stuff. He says, they accept everyone just as they are. They do all kinds of good things for the needy. They're making a real difference in their neighborhood. Made me proud to be Presbyterian. You made me proud to be Presbyterian. Fast forward 13 years. How are we doing with that? You know, the Lord's work requires constant recommitment. We need to keep investing and reinvesting in those things that matter for the work of God if we're going to run the long run of ministry. This is especially true and comes into sharper focus when a church is between pastors. It's easy when we have a pastor in place to let the pastor kind of drive the ship. But what about between times? Especially at such a time, the church needs all of its members to rise up, to take their responsibility, step up, their engagement in ministry, because after all, all of us are the ministers of the church, not just the pastors. When the new pastor arrives, we need to keep up that heightened involvement. That will make East Liberty Presbyterian Church truly a long-run church. Now, the season between pastors can and should be a time to build, but it's going to take a lot of intentionality. Because statistics tell us that on the average, churches between pastors begin to dwindle. Doesn't have to be like that. The difference is, do we step away and wait for, well, who's the next pastor going to be? Or do we step up and say, more than ever, we need to be engaged in doing this work. How will it be for ELPC? Amen.